Welcome to the Interim Whisperer, the show all about the future of work and innovation. Today's Interim Whisperer Employer Tip of the Week is remember when onboarding your new intern, you want to introduce them to people within your company. Make sure that you give them somebody to work with so that they feel welcomed and a part of your tribe or your team. So welcome, Ronsley, to the Interim Whisperer. It's really exciting to have you. Thanks, ladies. Thanks for having me. This is exciting. Yep. You are the founder of Must Amplify. We are podcast and the library of sound. You are a serial entrepreneur for sure. Yeah, I think it's called shiny ball syndrome. I see shiny balls and I go after them. That's that's (laughs) what that is. (laughs) You and I share that together. I'm going to go ahead and let Elizabeth kick us off with the questions and then she and I are going to take some turns with them. Hello. As you can not see today, I am invisible. (laughs) Okay, so first question up. Will you tell us a little bit about your educational background and your first job? It's funny because I I say this a lot on stage that uh, as an Indian person, we first have to do IT to figure out what we want to do with the rest of our life. (laughs) It's no different with me. I have a Bachelor of Software and uh, Computer Engineering. And then I did a master's of software engineering and wrote a thesis on process quality. And then I did, I worked for a bit and the company paid for uh, an MBA, which I did in psychology and leadership. Following that, I did a diploma in financial services because I wanted to become a financial advisor. I'm also a qualified chef. So uh, you can take this wherever you want, but in terms of academics, I, I think it's really interesting because now in entrepreneurship, you see one or, one or the other, right? You see someone who hates college and hates university and just preaches about that. And you ha- have the other side where the academia uh, realizes that everyone else is just like making it up as they go. So I have the blessing of being able to bring both those worlds together. And uh, some of the things I've learned at university in all in, in my courses, like I'm applying even now, in different ways and i think because of my my you know college and university uh classes my brain makes connections that are are very unique so that was uh my 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 educational background i started my first job was a software testing engineer and yeah, we used to develop, I say we, but the company used to develop auto guidance systems for tractors. So tractors would wake up in the morning based on GPS signals, would go and plow the field automatically and come park itself at the end of the day. And I was a testing engineer and then did really cool stuff and got them to an ISO 9001 accreditation. And then they got sold and it was a, a cool sort of progression. So yeah, uh, thank you for bringing back those memories. <laughs> what is Must Amplify, We Are Podcast, and the Library of Sound? It looks like they're all podcasting. So that's super passionate for you. Yeah, it's all on audio. It's all on voice. I think one of the, uh, a good friend of mine, Philip McKernan, has written a really good book. And in that book, he's got a quote called, your, your greatest gift lies next to your deepest wound. And I feel like my whole life it has been, well, growing up, it's been like my voice wasn't heard or it was questioned or every time I asked a question it was seen as questioning authority. And when I came to Australia, even though I spoke English my whole life, I came here 20 years ago, I didn't sound like this. Uh, so I had to change the way I spoke so that I could be understood. So there's all these little wounds I think that I have. And as a result, probably um, started everything around voice and uh, helping other people use their voice. So. Must Amplify is an agency. We help some of the most influential people on the planet from actors and politicians and influencers and entrepreneurs to create their own platforms and market that. And then we have We Are Podcasts, which started in 2015, which is the first podcasting conference in Australia. Um, and it happens every year. And the Library of Sound started in 2017, which is an audiobook service and is the first first agency to partner with Amazon in Australia to sign a 10 year deal to upload to Audible in Australia. So all around all different aspects of audio. One is a conference for podcasters, one's an agency to create audio marketing messages, and one is a audiobook service uh, in partnership with Audible. So that's what the three things are. And so you built just... an empire. 
<laughs> no, no, it is. Ju they're just they're just businesses that they support uh, each other. It's kind of an empire. Well, I I I have friends who have empires, and this is nothing <laughs> like those. So. <laughs> It will be though. It will be. So I'm in the same place. Like I have my Cat5 Studios company that produces the podcast and produces games. I have Intern Pursuits platform, but there's a game and a podcast tied with it. And then I have a consulting firm. So, you know, yeah, they all support one another. And it, I don't know about you, but I ask God for an empire. So it's, it's in transition and it's growing. So I think you've got an empire too. Good for you. For me, it's I, literally I when I think about like people ask me over the last year, especially they've been asking me about my goals. And I, to be honest, everything I thought I would achieve has already been done. And I'm like literally being in the moment right now and 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 realizing that my intellect is not as smart as the universe. So I <laughs> Ooh, <that's> humbling, right? <laughs> yeah. so humbling. <laughs> yeah. That's where I think we all come to is like, if this is all knowledge, right? Everything that's out there, this is how much we really know. And it's right between here. And that's still like microscopic is in this 100%. realm of life. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. We think we know a lot when we're like 16, 20, somewhere in there. <laughs> no, oh, I, I absolutely think I know everything. So oh, you, <laughs> yeah, no, you're a very humble person. I know that Elizabeth. You're <laughs> Oh, not at all. No, no, no. I don't have an empire, but you know, I will play Revenge of the Sith behind you guys if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested in, this isn't, I'm going completely off topic, just so you know, Elizabeth. I'm on the TEDx Orlando leadership team, and I saw that you did a TED Talk. So let's talk about your TED Talk a little bit, because I love TED Talks. It was a TEDx. That actually TEDx talk, when it was done, it was in 2017. Um, mm -hmm. And at I have this ritual, I have multiple rituals. And one of the rituals I have is I write a one year letter to myself. So at the end of the year, I write a letter to myself a year from now for and I'm grateful for all the things that have happened in the last year. And for whatever reason that year, I wrote TEDx talk in July. I'm grateful for the lot, you know, not even on my radar for whatever, however that transpired, like the universe has been quite kind. I did my TEDx talk August 2017, and it was amazing to do the 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 talk because even though i had been on stage before and I, I i don't really have an issue if someone randomly pulls me out of the crowd and say hey entertain this crowd for half an hour or an hour <laughs> no problem like at all like i'll be i'll find i'll find something to do but the tedx stage really gave me the i don't know the chills i thought of all the weirdest things that could possibly happen to me that all went through my brain I, I was six and a half weeks. I knew that I was going to be, you know, when it got confirmed, I had six and a half weeks. They were hard. I was just in my head a lot. And then a friend of mine was asking me three days before the thing, how is it going, Ronsley? And I said, uh, Nikki, I'm really nervous. And I complained for a good four minutes. And then she said, you know, Ronsley, this is not about you, right? <laughs> and I was like, huh, that was amazing because not only did my ego get a nice big kick up the bum it also stopped me from being nervous because it wasn't about me it was really about the message and i'm so glad i met her at that time in that timeline because i gave my tedx talk and even though it was supposed to be 16 and odd minutes it landed up becoming to 11 and a half minutes because i was like no nah, this is it this is done thank you and left and then in 20, at the start of 2020, it started last year, it got made a TED talk and got put on the TED.com website. And I was like, what the hell? That is crazy. So that has been my journey of the TEDx and TED talk. It has been very, very humbling because I went to the first one in Brisbane when it first happened in 2013. And I attended it. I still have my badge when other people gave the talk and I was like, oh, this is really cool. It would be amazing to be on this stage one day. And then going from a TEDx to a TED talk is just like, wow, I'm very, very humbled by it. 
Yeah, I asked to be on the leadership team because I really did want to learn, you know, how it, they ran it. And I have a goal also to do a TED talk, but you know, the TED talk, not the TEDx talk. Anyway, having worked on the backside of it, I had a newfound respect for it. I saw the amount of work that goes into it. What's beautiful is that no matter how, whatever it is that your TED talk is like, in post-edit, because TED's, uh, the TED standard is so high on the editing side, it looks flawless when anybody gets up there, no matter what. And so it's, uh, it makes everybody look amazing, I think. Great experience. I, I, it, it pushed me and grew me. And I'm very, very grateful to have had that stage. And even though since then, my hometown in Goa in India asked me to do one last year, I was so respectful of the platform that I realized I had nothing to say yet. So I said to them, when I have something to say, I, I will reach out and see whether you have a spot open. But yeah, I think it's Normally very they well have run. a theme. Normally there's a theme. They each each location has a theme and they didn't they did. give you a theme. They did. They had a theme. They had a theme 100 percent I can't remember what the theme was, to be honest, uh, off the top of my head, but they reached out to me. Actually, they informed me that my TEDx talk got made a TED talk. I had no idea that that happened. Wow. So they reached out and they said, We would you're 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 from Goa. This is your, you know, uh, hometown. Uh, we would love to have you. This is the theme. Your TEDx talk got made a TED talk. I'm like, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Google it. And that's how I found out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that is, it's a really big deal. It's a huge honor to be able to do one of those yeah. because it is very, an exclusive club. This was a little known fact. People, people could see that I was on the TEDx team in Orlando and they were saying, oh, we want to do it. Tell us when it's going to be happening, blah, 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 all of this. They said, let me tell you how it really works. <laughs> if you're a coach, then you don't stand a chance. If you're coming in and what you want to do is look to see what the themes are, identify if your message aligns with their theme, then apply because that's how you're going to be able to get in the door. You have to. You have to have it's a gotta, message. It's got to be an idea worth spreading. Of course, you yeah. take that very seriously. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that the, the, the TEDx teams all over the world do do that job because it's, uh, I can imagine the amount of coaches that want to speak on a TEDx stage so they can yeah. add that to their little thing. Yeah. 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 It is something. Okay. Elizabeth, you're up. Yes. Um, speaking of kind of uh, speaking and listening, can you tell us about how you first became interested in podcasting? Yeah. Well, it's funny when you were asking me that question, Elizabeth, it, I, my first memories went back to school where I was in the debate team. <gasps> that was my speaking sort of uh, and elocution teams. So like, oh, I didn't even think about this until right now. So <laughs> what a memory. <laughs> but for podcasting, to be honest, my first business uh, was a restaurant. So one of the things that I, you know, people tell, tell everyone a lot is build a business on your passion. And I've, uh, cooked for some of the most famous people on the planet. I have literally people have cried eating my food, no jokes. So what did I think? Let's go and create a restaurant. Uh, now not realizing that the business model to a restaurant is all broken and you could be the best chef, even though I, was, I wasn't a chef, then I, qualified to be a chef while I had the restaurant, I realized there was so many different elements to business. The point is, after four years of having a restaurant, the locks were changed overnight. So we had there, there was a legal issue with the landlords and the building people. And uh, we had a notice on the door saying it's shot. So basically overnight, uh, $478,000 of debt and uh, that was my first business. So when I'm talking about my journey as an entrepreneur, I've actually gone not from zero to on to million dollar companies from minus $478,000 <laughs> to I amplify that landed up becoming a million dollar company. So the so I had a job on Tuesday, but I was not employable. I had multiple jobs could not keep it. And I knew that I had to start a business as quickly as possible because that was probably the only way to sustain. 
So I created the Uber for chefing. It was done manually where they were from one end, we had chefs that had spare time. Uh, they would plug into the system. And the other end, there were people that wanted chefs to cook in their homes once a week would plug into the other end. So chefs would go to people's homes, cook all their meals based on a taste diagnosis and a goal diagnosis, put it all in their fridge and freezer in the Google calendar and do that week in, week out. So to promote that business, <laughs> I started a <laughs> podcast. <laughs> uh, and that's how, that's how that happened. And um, uh, the podcast uh, landed up getting a million listeners in four and a half months and the rest is history. Holy cow, that's amazing. That is truly amazing. Your favorite genre of podcast, what do you like to listen to? I love podcasts now that take the time to curate the content for my consumption. So they actually take the time to have a storyline so that I'm listening to something in order. So I'm a, I'm a fan of podcasts now that are a high budget, unfortunately, because that's what it takes to, to, to edit a podcast down to that level. So love WNYC uh, and love everything that Gimlet do, obviously, but WNYC, Radiolab, Freakonomics, those are the, mm -hmm. those are the tests and the tests of time, I think. Masters of Scale. That's one of my favorites. Masters of Scale. Yeah. I mean, obviously love uh, Reed, Reed Hoffman. And what, what he does uh, in, in everything is just uh, phenomenal. But from a business standpoint, probably one of the good good podcasts that are out there. I really love how Freakonomics takes a topic and breaks it down. And I, I love the idea of getting deeper into a topic as, a, as opposed to getting deeper into a person. I think I've, I've done 1400 interviews now in the last seven, eight years. And, and I, I love going deeper into topics and, and more better discussions that way. Mm, yeah, I, I understand what you mean. It, by talking with people, you know, and you do the interviews, like you've already told me a book and I'm going, okay, I'm going to go and look at that one. I've not ever looked at the Freakonomics you know, podcast, so I'm going to go and look at that one. So sometimes the bandwidth, even if it's large, just as encouragement, it's like not everybody will find you as easily. So you're really introducing people to a lot of information that they may not have heard before. And then they can go and, you know, dig deeper into something. So I bet you have that impact more than what you realize. <laughs> you know, they say everyone has a reason for becoming an entrepreneur, you know, for the longest time it is it for me, I did, I still struggle with still struggle with celebrating success. Like I yeah. genuinely don't know how to, uh, my wife has to constantly remind me and she's like, let's do this. And I'm like, I don't know how this is celebration, but okay. I don't really know how to enjoy the success properly. So for me, it's literally the, like, I, I think I just keep going on to the next thing. And then I go, someone says, Hey, that's pretty cool that you did that. I'm like, oh, yeah, I, I did that. That's, that's uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's amazing though, because, well, I think it's good. That's probably why you have a wife because she's there to remind you, Hey, you got kids here. You got a wife. Who do you think's putting up with you? Right. <laughs> and keeping you grounded. So that could be part of it. And then you've got this amazing circle of people that are there to help you enjoy the moment too. And say, let's celebrate that you hit the bullseye. That's pretty cool. It's hard to do. Very, very blessed. And I'm just, uh, you know, I'm I'm normally in the States five months of the year, but the last 18 months I've been not traveling. I was actually in yeah. the States working out of Vayner Media when the whole world shut down. And I took a flight on the 13th of March from JFK to LA with 50 people, not in the airplane, in the airport at JFK. Wow. It was craziest thing. I miss I miss my friends back in the States for sure. Yeah, this pandemic's been pretty hard on a lot of things, but from what I've noticed, it's it's been pretty okay for your podcasting businesses and companies because you can't really go anywhere and they're not really making a whole lot of new episodes on TV shows because actors can't get within, you know, six feet of each other. But podcasting does seem to be something that a lot of people picked up and started listening to. Yeah, I mean... Uh, when I started doing this eight years ago, I was convincing people that a podcast was a good idea for business. And 
and <laughs> they were having none of it at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but the things that I was saying is was true then and is still true now is if we look at the different mediums that are out there and if we look at the, the maturity of the social media for images, look at the maturity of social media for images and how we stop all our events to click a selfie so we can put it on these social media in, you know, platforms. And, and images is not native to us, but voice and stories and talking is native to us. Mm -hmm. So if, if you kind of look at how we tell stories or how we communicate, parents sing to their kids even before they're born, mm -hmm. uh, there's this huge element of being connected and then we had the, uh, you know, the evolution of social media for voice, which started at the end of last year with Clubhouse and now Spotify and LinkedIn and all of them getting into Facebook, getting into social media for audio. So voice is going to be the next thing that everyone is going to is going to uh, gather around primarily Elizabeth, because you look at how mature video is, you look at how mature blogging is, you look at how mature images are. And we've not even scratched the surface for audio, uh -huh. but also you don't have barriers in audio that uh, other mediums have. For example, audio is the only form of content that you can consume while you're doing other things. Mm -hmm. Everything else, you've got to stop what you're doing to consume. So the element of engagement is high when it comes to audio. It's very different to someone listening to your voice for half an hour as opposed to, you know, reading a book of yours for half an hour or watching um, a, 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 a Instagram video of yours or a reel or watching a post, very different engagement to hearing your voice for that long. So I <laughs> am a huge proponent of voice, obviously, but with a lot of things happening and the way it's happened, there's no denying that uh, voice and audio is the next big thing to explode. I totally agree with you because it's also the one, I think right now, it's the one type of media that is not regulated, like radio is, like TV, and anybody can set up a podcast, and we can do it just like this through Zoom, like you don't have to have special equipment even, I mean, you really should for sound quality, but nonetheless, the point is that Nobody's here saying, oh, we're going to go shut you down. Yeah. And it's the best thing, right? It's the best thing. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's allowed people to have their reps. So it gets them more confidence. It gets them. And you, and especially on Clubhouse, I realize when someone joins Clubhouse and speaks up for the first time, you can hear that they are trying to put their thoughts into words and, and, and being able to give that uh, their, their thoughts and audience. And it's not as simple as someone who's been podcasting for ages realizes that I realize that, oh, I have the reps and I have done this. So it becomes easier for me to express myself. But in general, we are thought not to express ourselves. We're thought not to go against the system. We're thought not to raise our hand. We're thought not to uh, spoil the status quo. So I think it's time for us all to speak up because the wrong voices are being heard and mm -hmm. they're getting most of the attention and we've got to change that. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Favorite tips that you give to people about growing their own podcast? Any? Yeah. I mean, growing, growing a, a podcast is obviously one of the questions I get asked the most. And uh, the response I have to that is first figuring out whether you have a consumable show because there are movies that get millions and billions of dollars be put behind it that never make it to the blockbuster because it's a movie and <laughs> <laughs> for lack of another word so usually for most podcasters because podcasting is so new there's no way to be regulated and all that kind of stuff usually it is first fixing the podcast for it to be consumable and then start to look at other tactics to grow the podcast and there are so many tactics the best way to grow a podcast is to get on other podcasts because you you know that the listeners are already mm -hmm. there. I mean, I would say that's probably the 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 quickest and the most you know the most easiest in terms of uh, less icky way to grow your thing. You just have conversations, build relationships, and you land up growing your audience, which is one of my most favorite ways to do it. Yeah. So, how did you get that million followers? 
<laughs> so I and are they all from India or are they, you know, Australia or are they global? I would think they're global. They were, they were actually 133 countries that we had listeners from. And what happened was I, when I started releasing the podcast, I released them Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 8 a.m. sharp uh, for, I don't know how many months, but I think because of the consistency, iTunes put me on the banner section next to Triple J and ABC Radio. Mm -hmm. So that kept going, the six banners that kept going around. So that just pff, grew my audience and then it kept going from there. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, iTunes, when they first came out, they were, anybody that had been starting podcasts at that time when they first launched, I would think that they're just, their followers are just massive. That's what I thought when I joined for the people that started five years before me. Mm. <laughs> yeah, surprisingly, my my show's organic in how it grows. And we we look at our numbers to see like how are they growing in the United States and then also globally. So what I cannot for the life of me figure out is like Michigan loves us. Michigan in the United States, we get so many downloads in Michigan, like more than Florida, not really, but you know, it's it's pretty high up there. And I go, Who's in Michigan? I don't know anybody in Michigan that's like there. <laughs> and then the next thing that's always surprising, a country that likes us a lot is the Nordic countries. I think it's uh, Norway. And it's just like, who's in there? Why is it that they're liking us there? So we, we're taking it. We love it. But it's just a lot of fun. It's kind of like Christmas for me. It's like, oh. <gasps> Oh my gosh, you know, who's finding us now? And it it's consistent with how I was wanting to see the footprint layout. Like I had picked 13 states due to high density population, you know, large schools, things like that. And it's pretty much following that footprint. And I did not intentionally try to do that. I mean, usually the stories are very similar in the sense that I was not trying anything, to be honest. I didn't know yeah. uh, anything at the time. And uh, you just take what comes really. So I don't know where they got the graphics from. They made the graphics up and they put it up there. And, and you know what, like people that started before me, the John Lee Dumas's of the world, the Pat Flynn's of the world, the Jordan Harbinger's of the world, they had similar sort of stories, but in other ways that they got their attraction. But I think there's all these different ways that if you do it for long enough, something happens and you get the traction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my show's been four years. This is our fourth year. And it is, it is, you know, it's just like on autopilot right now. We're on three live radio stations, 16 podcast channels, and we have, you know, our own YouTube and our own Facebook page, but it's wow. the podcast channels that are really going very well. We have three other radio stations that are going to pick us up also. So that's, that's amazing. Cool. And you're saying you're in Orlando, right? Yes. Uh, I was in Orlando before flying to New York there for, cause I did the closing for Podfest in 2020 in oh, Orlando. Oh, you know Chris then? You know Chris? Yeah, Kuritza? yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. I, um, he, he got me to do closing keynote for 2020 Podfest and then everything went crazy. So I've been to Orlando a few times cause I spoke the previous year as well. Ah, oh, yeah. Uh, not in 2019, but well, no, it was at the beginning. Uh, you know, when he did the, um, he wanted to break the Guinness record, 5,000. Yeah. So yeah. that was the that year. Was after. Yeah, that was 2019, right? Yeah. That was last that. year. It was 2020. So I was on his podcast. I was a speaker there while well, I was on PodFest and we broke that record. And so everybody that was a part of it, we all got to have that little Guinness world record. That was so exciting. Chris is amazing. I love him. He's been on Chris. a guest on the show too. Chris is amazing. Yeah. Very, very hospitable, amazing human being. Mm, yes, he is. Yeah. Okay, Elizabeth, you go. I'm going to take a, take a breather here. <laughs> um, yeah. Both of you have been doing podcasting for quite a few years, but uh, specifically Ronsley, after years of of being in the podcasting business, what still keeps you passionate and keeps you going? Hmm. Well, hearing hearing people speak up for the first time is just like I didn't think that it would give me that much joy, but it does uh, give me a lot of joy. 
uh, when people speak up for the first time. Also, when people shed a story that they have told themselves for a long time and, and suddenly have this realization that that's just a story. I have a lot of, um, I love those moments a lot. In terms of keeping on going, I, I just think that more and more people need to share their voice. I feel like, you know, we share our voices in bubbles where we think it's safe because uh, there's no there's no lack of people trying to be a be crit critical of our voices. So just knowing that there are so many stories that are not heard. Uh, in the last year, I've interviewed a lot of Aboriginal elders, and you hear the stories that are not heard. I've interviewed four entrepreneurs on death row. Uh, in North Carolina, that was another privilege to do. And you hear those stories that are not being told and you look around the planet and you realize that, you know, when COVID happened, all we needed to know is the truth. That's all we wanted. Mm -hmm. And there's nowhere that we could go to consume the truth, real truth. Uh, we, I, I still don't know what to believe, to be honest. And that is scary, not for necessarily our lifetime or necessarily for us in the first world, which we don't really realize how lucky we are to have all the amenities. And that's for anyone that's listening to this podcast that thinks that when there is a lockdown, the first thing you go and get is toilet rolls is <laughs> you're probably in a very lucky position. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I just look at that and I have been blessed with the perspective of seeing what poverty looks like and what rich looks like in all its different forms. And I just think having those stories being told and not censored and not made into a game show and not made into some sort of drama and not being told like it's to get more clicks, just being told like the way it is and being told for the sake of making sure that these stories are heard so people don't feel alone. I think put that all together, I feel like I have a responsibility because my ancestors did not have this, this gift of being able to say whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted. So for all the work that they've done, I think it's just respectful to keep that work going. Mm. The Intern Whisperer is brought to you by Cat5 Studios, who help you create games and videos for your training and marketing needs that are out of this world. Visit Cat5 Studios for more information to learn how Cat5 Studios can help your business. Thank you, Cat5 Studios. Let's jump over into 2030. What do you think podcasting is going to look like? Because we did some research and, you know, there's like 10 topics we found from, you know, a, an article on LinkedIn. And they mentioned ratings and reviews would be meaningless. Now, this is why he said that the, the number of reviews on iTunes has no correlation to the size or, or quality of the show. Only 0.6% of all podcasts get over 100 ratings on iTunes. And most of these are older shows that have launched when iTunes was the dominant player. I mean, it makes sense when you think about Correct. it that way. Correct. I mean, when you think of reviews and ratings, the reviews and ratings only live on iTunes. Yeah. But now Spotify has got into the game big time mm -hmm. the sen in the sense that people would rather say, listen to my podcast on Spotify than say, listen to my podcast on iTunes, because it's almost <laughs> like you're competing with the other artists that are already on Spotify, which is, you know, uh, <laughs> the Britney, Spears, uh, Britney Spears, the Beyonce's <laughs> of the world or whoever. I don't, Britney yeah. Spears. Like, <laughs> Free Britney <laughs> but Spears. I think yeah. <laughs> yeah, free, I really like that is such a sad story. But I, I, you're, you're, you're right. When we think about reviews and ratings, you think about new and noteworthy. All those things have changed. We also think about subscribers now changed to followers. So there's a lot of change happening. But I think what is going to be really fascinating now is like it's hard to say what's going to happen in 2030. To be honest, oh, yeah, primarily, yeah, it's, it's just a like this is what I think. So there's no yeah. right or wrong answer, honestly. There isn't, but primarily because of Clubhouse, social media for, for audio. That is the, the main reason why we can't predict what's going to happen in 2030. Because right now we're trying to figure out what the etiquette is for audio. 
Mm -hmm. We're still trying to figure out what that is on Clubhouse and the new platforms. And then when you take that and you realize that people are going to get a chance to practice on Clubhouse before they get a, before they create their podcast, I believe what's going to land up happening is Clubhouse or the social media for audio or voice is going to be like, you know, how comedians do their practice sets in the, in the, in these clubs that they go in every day that are empty and they have to do their practice sets and someone pokes their head into the door and you still have to launch the, you know, land the punchline, even if they leave. I think that is what Clubhouse and social media for audio is going to be. And then podcast is going to land up becoming the Netflix special for that person. So think of it that way. I, I, I feel like that's what's going to happen. Podcasts are going to get better because they have the chance to practice. And then they're going to have a whole bunch of tools that are going to change, you know, with people's use of vid, of, uh, of voice and audio more because people haven't been really using it that well. So it's going to be fascinating to see. I'm as uh, curious about what's going to happen in 2030 as I suppose everyone else. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, the, the amazing thing is that it's not just audio because people are doing podcasts just like we're doing right now with video. It's still a podcast and they can, you know, rip the audio portion and put it over there on just audio site. But it, it does encroach upon what is seen as, um, we'll call it TV, but not really TV, you know, just the videos portion of it. And it's another way that people can get news or discuss what is what is real, what is true? Because just like you were saying about COVID, it's really important to try and get you know the facts out there. And I think that's what we've seen going on in a lot of the social channels um, because people are putting it up there, but they're all governed by Facebook or by YouTube. There's you know regulatory processes and people that are there doing it. But if you're running your own podcast, you know the rules are not the same in many instances. Sli yeah, slightly different, but then you think that iTunes and Spotify, all these platforms can, you know, regulate or throttle the amount of views or listeners someone gets depending on what their algorithm is. So I think just having your own platform, obviously on your own media, on, on, on Libsyn or whatever, on your own media site, media server, and being able to say whatever you want to say, even that takes practice <laughs> saying whatever you want to say, because we, we don't really realize how much we edit for the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, being a podcaster, I think, uh, challenges some of those, those, those boundaries. Mm -hmm. I agree. Super interesting. Yeah. Another kind of prediction for 2030 in podcasts is that podcasts will impact elections. I think we already saw this this past year, specifically at least specifically for me and my gen, uh, was TikTok. There was a lot of things that happened on TikTok where uh, a, a rally got canceled, sort of, um, uh, and kind of how social media, specifically podcasts, are going to impact elections. What do you think about that? Huh. I, uh, I have to agree because I, in 2016, I interviewed two mayors. And I interviewed the Gold Coast mayor in 2016, and I got a lot of people that uh, sent me a message saying, I didn't know Tom Tate was like this until I heard the interview. Mm -hmm. And it was really fascinating because, you know, politicians were not wanting to get interviewed on podcasts at the time because they didn't know what to expect. And uh, I am just fascinated about how many people got in touch with me because they saw a different version of Tom Tate or heard a different version of Tom Tate. And I did not even think that I just wanted to interview a male. Like I thought that would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, I can totally believe that a podcast can just shed some, some crazy light on on someone, but saying that the other mayor that I interviewed, who, who used to be the mayor of Ipswich for like 20 years, is now uh, behind bars because of some something he got caught doing that I, can't, I don't even know. But <laughs> it's crazy to be able to know that I went to his office and he gave me a little like Ipswich uh, town uh, souvenir because I interviewed him. <laughs> but uh, he's now in jail. Crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So the next prediction that we found is Paola will be punished. 
So in the 50s, people were on you know, the radio industry and they would go to jail for accepting money from a record company to promote and play music. That was what was going on. But today we can clearly hear statements that will say this is a paid endorsement, right? We know that's going on and you know, it can cost money. You can charge your guests to be you know, a part of the show. There's, you know, then it becomes their show, so to speak. You know, if you're doing it because they're paying to be on your show. So this is part of that discussion. You know, currently some shows are charging guests, but they don't openly disclose it. You know, it kind of depends on what's going on there. So are you paying to get your message out there? Or is this clearly like, I don't charge anybody to be on my show because I want it to be just a free conversation and just what's yeah, going on? I, what do you think? I would avoid anyone that's charging to be on their show. I would I would avoid them and not touch them with a barge pole. And the reason for that, yeah, it's it's absolutely one hundred percent true. Is because those people are ruining the medium. Like mm -hmm. it is, you know, Gary has this great quote that I think gets repeated way too often, and it's true. A market has ruined everything, and these are the and it's not really marketers. I think they're just douches who just have no sense of integrity, no sense of value exchange. And I find that, you know, if you're charging someone and I know a lot of people are doing this under the covers in the sense that it's this backdoor thing that if someone says, come on my show, they first go, oh, yeah, I normally charge people to be on my show and this is how much I charge. And someone will say, oh, I'm, I never pay to be on shows. And they go, oh, no, no worries. I'll just do, do, do you or don't tell anyone else. Mm -hmm. But they're waiting to poach people who have no idea yeah. that you don't pay to be on podcasts. And this really annoys the shit out of me because there are lots of people way before me that have done incredible work to make sure podcasts are for the people and it's created yeah. so that people can start their, have their own voice whenever they feel like it. Mm -hmm. And then we have clowns like this that come and just ruin everything. So that's just how strongly I feel about that. So it's disappointing. Elizabeth, well, it, jump in there. Oh, go it, ahead. It, it, yeah, I was going to say it depends on what their their day is like. For example, even though I know Gary, I can pick up the call, phone and call him, I'm not going to ask him to be on my podcast because I know for a fact that people, his time is really valuable and people pay to get his time mm -hmm. and very, very high amounts of money to pay get his time. So yeah, he might be doing me a favor, but I'm aware that it would be a favor. So I'm, <laughs> I don't need to ask yet. You know what I mean? Yeah. So in that regard, I, I, I feel like certain people, depending on what their day job is, which, you know, Gary's day job every 15 oh, minutes he's is in demand. At like oh, at that. So in those instances, I understand, but when people are, there are people who are just started off their podcast that are charging people to be on their show for some dumb reason. Yeah. Jump in there and government regulation. Go ahead. Is yeah. It, government uh, regulation. That's another prediction for the uh, possible future. You know, the government likes to control things. So what do you think uh, the government might do? Well, I hope they don't touch anything. <laughs> 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 yeah <laughs> I, I i'm I, I get annoyed with the government in general because they ask us to give a list of expenses and uh and income right down to the last cent of what where our money goes and where we earn the money and yeah. where that is being but they don't tell us where our money is being spent mm -hmm. have, we have no idea where we're, they're spending our money and it's a bit crazy that they can put us behind bars if we didn't account for a bunch of dollars but they have no accountability over things so i hope the government does not touch uh podcasting i hope i know a lot of people that will uh hopefully uh stand for that <laughs> you never know <laughs> until it comes to it so uh, but uh, but i just hope they don't get uh, control over that because that's just another media channel government's getting control over that it would get so nasty so aggressive so quickly mm, i agree authentic it will be more 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 authentic conversations instead of having the choices that we've typically seen and and whether it's radio or in tv you know whatever streaming devices that people watch 
those are very, very polished. These are truly real conversations with real people. And I think it's going to get even, uh, because we have influencers, right? We have micro influencers. I think we're going to see that begin to emerge here in the same way. It's like, you know, me, I'm just a little person, but I have the show and I love doing the show too. And I love meeting people like you. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I that's why I love podcasts. I, I absolutely, without a doubt, interview shows are my favorite because I get to meet people and that's probably the, the best thing about podcasting for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I do like the idea of having deeper conversations though. You have piqued my interest with that. I have had other people come back a second time and we just continue building a deeper conversation on whatever it is their specialty. I know yeah. that we're coming close to the end of where we have just a little bit of time with you. So Elizabeth, analytics. Yeah. Analytics will be awesome. <laughs> we're going to learn a little bit more about like how many people are listening, how long, when do they drop off, you know, stop listening, who are they? Um, and this will help kind of answer a lot of questions that podcasters have right now, you know, how to engage better. Why are people dropping off when they do um, a Nielsen rating for podcasts will arrive and everyone will have transparent real time information. I mean, even now, if you go to Chartable, I think, and other places on podcasts that that rate podcasts in different ways, I think there's going to be different places where you can get ratings or, you know, have some sort of a billboard chart list, maybe. to <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and, and I think all those are really good so that it allows new shows to get found. It's just that if those places land up repeating the same things, then, you know, you just see the same shows. But we've been wanting analytics, better analytics for a long time. I have no doubt that that that, that is going to be something that uh, is going to improve. But also, I feel like there's going to be create the content for the people so i'm i'm a huge i we've wanting we've been wanting more better analytics for ages so i'm i'm glad that's on the cards but we've been saying that for a while too yeah i hope those analytics can do a better job of breaking down like who my listening audience is because it can tell me you know the geographic location i look forward to the day when it can tell me the gender the age group you know those types of pieces of information that are going to be really, really helpful. And I'm sure that's where AI is going to come into it and refine that search of, you know, whatever the device is, it's going to be picking up that number, whatever that IP address is or whatever, it's going to pick it up and then it's going to start pulling it in. And I'll know that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to tell you, thank you so much. I know you're going on to your next podcast, but it has been delightful getting to know you. So thank you. I really appreciate it. I hope, I hope I get to, you know, have you as a guest again. And I know that we're supposed to be coming in. I'm going to be on your clubhouse soon. Yeah, please. I mean, I um, feel free, even if you're not on that particular one, when you, when, whenever that one is scheduled, but to come on any other clubhouse that I do, would love to have both of you on. So feel free to like join. I already did. But I've joined it, been listening. Nice. Uh, yeah. I'm glad. <laughs> uh, I'm going to bring you up next time. So just now that we got a chance to chat, happy to be on again, whatever you'll need. Uh, super happy to promote. Um, so thank you for having me. You take care. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ronsley. <laughs> You. So Elizabeth, it was really great having Ronsley as a guest on the show. I want to continue this conversation though. So we talk about Clubhouse. Yeah, absolutely. What, mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, what did you think? I thought he was an amazing guest. I really enjoyed it. And I want oh, to have him yeah. back again. Oh, absolutely. I thought, I thought he was wonderful, well-spoken. He had a lot of fun ideas and opinions that we really got to dive into. Yeah. So at the end of the show, since he's not here to tell us how people can find him, we're going to help him out by giving that information. In the meantime, let's talk about Clubhouse. It's the latest social media app. You had to be a part of, I, you know, have an iPhone to be invited to get into it. If you don't have an iPhone, you're out of luck because that was part of the requirements. And it's amazing. It has now more than 2 million people using it each week and it's valued at over get this, a billion dollars. That's crazy to me. That's crazy. Yeah. People are wondering, you know, is this the thing that's going to be taking over podcasting? Is this, you know, the brand new social media that, you know, oh, it's going to put Instagram and Facebook to shame? 
Yeah, so this is what's so popular. One of the reasons why it's so popular. You can have a large group of people. And remember, it was at a time when nobody was able to get together in like bars or in conferences, you know, in different sizes of communities there. And it allows people to gather in what would feel like a space and be able to have conversations. And you can, it, unlike being in Zoom, you're not on camera. It's just the audio voices. So now it takes away that, that I don't know, the having to feel like you have to turn your camera on because it goes back mm -hmm. to, oh, it's like a phone call. Oh, it's okay. It's cool. It's a conference call. But there's structure to it. There's a moderator. You can have panel discussions. You can have breakout rooms. You can do different things like that. And so it's really very, very, I would call it innovative, but it's still something, you know, it's just taking something that's there and flipping it up to another level. So I think it probably will. It offers people a loose collection of drop-in events and clubs and an opportunity to either learn more about or be seen as an expert in. And you can get up there and you can talk about any type of topics from startups all the way to sexual dysfunction, all the way over to how to crochet or the best ways <laughs> to do stuff. It's like similar to like meetup, but you have thousands, hundreds, and sometimes several thousands of people that drop in to just have these conversations. And it doesn't have any sort of chat box or area to type in, it's all audio, which I think presents a whole new sort of unique set of opportunities and issues. Opportunities being that, you know, you can't just say something rude or cruel just to make somebody else feel bad. Like this way you have to kind of take ownership of your own voice and you know what you're putting out into the universe. They were talking about jobs that can be done. We tend to listen to podcasts when we're working out, we're commuting, we're going for a walk. Those are all things that I do. I listen to podcasts, I listen to music that way. And it's places where you can go and listen to clubhouse conversations. We only have so many in a, so many hours in a day to consume content. And podcasts will no doubt find themselves in a battle with Clubhouse for that audience. They call it ear share in this article. Some might say that Clubhouse even serves a different purpose because it's allowing you to contribute and to get more voices out there. Just like, you know, Ronza was saying to get your voice out there. I think that's really going to be the key. So yeah, absolutely. go ahead. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's allowing you to get your voice out there and you don't really have to have some sort of huge platform to be able to kind of do this. All you have to really have is an iPhone. And I think, uh, I think that's a great way to kind of get your opinions out there, mm -hmm. um, but it does have some potential problems. So there are some limitations of clubhouse and even conversational podcasts will have this, this type of a massive edge over clubhouse. Unlike podcasts, which can be listened to for years after the fact, Clubhouse conversations are, I don't even know how to say this word. Ephemeral. Ephemeral. Okay, so you can listen to a conversation in real time, or you don't have to listen to it at all. In that way, it's a lot uh, kind of like live theater. You're either there or you're not there. Mm. Basically, it is just like Snapchat. Not really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's very similar to, to Snapchat or live theater, like I was saying, like you're either there and you get to be a part of the experience that's put forth for you or, or you don't, you know, kind of like when you make a sandcastle in the ocean. Another limitation is that clubhouse rooms are capped to 5,000 people. That sounds like a lot of people to me, but it not only presents <laughs> access issues for popular events, but also it limits the monetization opportunities for the host. I don't know, maybe not. What if it if, if you're going to charge for it? What if it's $100 to get into the room? What if it's $1,000 to get into the room? Does that really limit the monetization opportunities? I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't think it does. I think there's, you know, an opportunity to be a part of the room for 5,000 people, but then there's also kind of a potential negative where you only let certain people into your room because they have, you know, the right amount of money to be able to get in. You're very right. You're very, very right. 
Clubhouse doesn't offer an in-app advertising function, and this will also, together with those room caps, doesn't seem to incentivize the creators to invest energy in bringing their best content to the platform. But you know what's so great about these kind of problems is it really does take people out of, oh, well, that's the way it is. They sit here and go, oh, that's the way it is? Well, let's figure a way to go around it. So people are trying to solve these problems. And I don't think that we should underestimate the power of those super creative people. Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. Another potential limitation is that Clubhouse conversations are usually unresearched, which, you know, of course, it, it could be a strength or a weakness. You know, you get to kind of have conversations and learn people's honest opinions. And sometimes that's with a well-informed and experienced moderator guiding the conversation. Or sometimes it could be somebody who doesn't actually potentially know what they're talking about and is spreading false information and facts that could potentially cause more harm than good. Yeah, people can do that on podcasts too, because that's why when we were talking about earlier with Ronsley on the show, that people... Um, they can get out there and they can, if there's going to be fact checking, we should probably go back and cover those other four areas too. But people will do more fact checking to ensure that the information that is going out on their podcast, because people will go back and listen to it. Hey, wait a minute. You know, you said this, you said that there were 10 people that showed up. And then on this other episode, you said 20 people. Okay, so which is it? Is it 10 people or 20 people? I'm not really sure. I think that's going to be really important because, you know, people are going to want to make sure that, you know, there's authentic conversations going in place. Telling the truth is so important these days. You know, that's what we focus on so much. And reading articles from the New York Times or the Washington Post, whoever you read, you know, like, oh, well, is this news article telling me the truth or are they telling me their biased opinion of the truth? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to give a little shout out here for Ronsley so that people would know how to find him. One of the places that you can go, well, not one of them, many of them is on Spotify. He's on Spotify. He's on Instagram. He's on Twitter. He's on LinkedIn and also on Facebook. And you can also, he shared his uh, email. It's me at ronsley.com.au for Australia. You're going to get in touch with Jenna though. And if you want to have Ronsley as a guest on your show, that's what you need to do is contact Jenna at me, M-E at ronsley.com.au. And you will be able to um, have him as a guest on your show. And hopefully people know that, you know, He's a pretty cool guy and he'll be able to, he's not intimidated by any topic. Absolutely. All right. Well, I want to give a little shout out. I want to thank Cats 5 Studios as being the sponsor of our show. Thank you to the production team, Axel Lopente and Elizabeth Herbert. Me. <laughs> yes. Associate producer interns. Our video and audio editing team is Steve Neese. Video interns, Raymond Ahmad Khan, Berkeley Walgamot. Mitsari Rosales Vargas, and our sound engineer and music composer, Dave Francis, Miguel Centra. And we also want to give a shout out to Sophie Lloyd, who also created music for our show. So if you would be so kind to visit Inter Pursuit at www.interpursuit.tech, you could also sign up and be recognized as an employer for change if your company loves to work with interns. We would love to have you as a guest on the interim whisper subscribe to our show on podbean or whatever your favorite podcast channel is so good night and thank you for listening to us